For more on the headlines now, I'm joined by Sky News political reporter Trudy McIntosh and Cam Redden. Well, thank you to you both. We're missing Andrew Clennell. He's off sick. We wish him all the best. But let's start with that report from the Australian Financial Review today that says the top jobs for the Australian Federal Police, our domestic spy agency ASIO, the Australian Signals Directorate and Border Force, that's a pretty, pretty big uh, quaddy there. They'll all fall vacant in coming months. Trudy, we saw, of course, there in the package, the new Defence Force Chief announced today. He's a very safe pair of hands, Vice Admiral David Johnson. But all those other roles, ASIO and Border Force in particular, hugely important given the domestic terror risk we've been told that there is and also this resurgence in illegal boat traffic. I have to say... If I, I was back in the Prime Minister's office, I'd be recommending you, you roll over some of these incumbents because changing all of them at the same time involves a lot of risk, doesn't it? It certainly does. And you can see a case I can see, particularly for the ASIO boss, Mike Burgess, to get a term extension. We saw that when Labor came into office with the Chief of Defence, that Angus Campbell was given a two-year extension to ensure there was continuity. I can see that happening for ASIO. As for Border Force, Michael Outram, he's already been given an extension once to get him to this November. If you were looking at a political case for Labor, if they want to reset politically when it comes to boats Changing the Border Force commander in Michael Outram uh, would give them a fresh face, an opportunity to try and say we are cracking down on these boat arrivals, three in the space of a couple of months, arriving seemingly undetected. So a big task ahead of this government, these series of appointments they need to work through. Some of the others are not so imminent, but uh, those two posts, the AFP mm. commissioner as well, uh, big decisions need to be made in that area. Oh, well, I would say with Outram, I mean, he was there when the boats were stopped most of Border Force yeah. were. Uh, obviously, we haven't got Mike Pizzullo, the chief there anymore, the secretary of the department. But, I mean, the, the issue, Trudy, is the change in personnel at the yeah. political level. That's the difference. And that's uh, only an election can make that, that change. Let's go to that research from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, that's found interest rate hikes have hit Australian households harder than anywhere else in the world. Now, that's in part due to our very low share of fixed rate mortgages, heavy household debt burdens and, of course, limited housing supply. Cam, it might surprise people at home to know that only 15% of us have got a fixed rate mortgage compared to homeowners in the US. They're at 90% in terms mm. of fixed loans. And, of course, they pay the one rate for the whole lifetime of the loan. So if you get a 30-year loan and you come in at 5.5% on your mortgage, you stay 5.5% all the way through the life of the loan. But uh, you look at those sort of da that data out today, you look at those graphs and you realise it's any wonder we're in a cost of living crisis. And, of course, the other point with the United States, Peter, is in a dozen of those states, if you can't pay your loan, you can just stick the keys in the door and walk away and the bank is left to sell it. And if they are the ones that end up with a loss, well, tough luck. That's a, a power that many mortgage owners in the US have. Of course, you can't do that in Australia here. So, so many families are tied to the family home for better or worse, even if they have stretched themselves so far to get in the door in the first place. And now so many millions of Australians are really at the whim of the Reserve Bank. And some of those hopes of a rate cut by the end of the year, Peter, are fast dying off and dying out. We've got unemployment still well below four. We have that shock figure of February at 3.7%. We've got inflation still above four mm. at a quarterly basis. And where I think this really becomes an electoral challenge too, Peter, is as the number of renters rises in the voting population, of course, making up a third of all Australian voters, a third of them rent, that base is there for the taking. We've seen the Greens vote surge amongst renters, even to a point where in the latest news poll, the primary vote for the Greens and the coalition amongst renters is basically neck and neck because some of those offerings are appealing to renters. The Greens have got an electoral currency amongst people who are aspirational, trying to get into a home, but they feel like it's out of reach. So this is going to be a real battleground in the next election. We've seen the coalition really double down on the view of offering super as a way of trying to get into a home, but it doesn't seem to be showing that that's winning people over. Instead, that green space amongst renters and young Australians continues to rise. So expect this to be a real battleground, not just in the weeks and months after the budget, but right the way through to election day next year. I think speculation about RBA cutting rates, Cam, is going to absolutely dominate the political chatter out of Canberra. The government needs a win 
oh, in I this know. area because they cannot spend enough in the budget, I think, to make a meaningful dis uh, difference without really spiking inflation. So that'll be the challenge for Jim Chalmers in May. But what about this stuff today, Trudy, about all the investors in the renewables energy space hmm. saying that they will walk as much as $5 trillion worth of investment will go overseas if, no surprises here, they don't get more subsidies. I mean, talk about uh, renewables being cheap. It's, it's a money pit. Well, they've got their hand out, but I reckon they're about to get a whole lot more cash. That's certainly the expectation given Chris Bowen, you don't forget this capacity investment scheme, it's been announced before, but he's promising Chris Bowen to give us more details in the next few weeks as to how it works. Essentially, it's underwriting new renewable projects to get them in the grid by 2030. But we don't know how much it's going to cost. This is a reverse auction scheme. Chris Bowen saying we'll have some more details in a few weeks, but expect big numbers in that front. I mean, any path you go down is going to cost the taxpayer money here. Prolonging coal, getting more gas into the system, even Peter Dutton's nuclear push, let's be frank, is going to cost the taxpayer a lot of money. I reckon if you aggregate the cost of all the money we've spent on renewables up to date, nuclear is a cheap option. I'll do the maths on that and come back tomorrow.